Um, and good morning, Melbourne. Ah, uh, right, where are we? Look, I'm not new to this field of chronic disease prevention and public health. Uh, and for that I apologise. I've spent my career in the big four diseases and trying to prevent them, those diseases that will kill 90% of us, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and perhaps the most insidious of them all, the neurological disorders, Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, you've got to die of something, so what do we care? Well, um, and frankly, you won't care when you're dead. But the trouble is with these chronic diseases is that they affect quality of life. So for that 90% of us who suffer these diseases, will suffer more than a decade of disability before we die. And even then, well, it's our, it costs us a lot and it's our older people, but there's an even more human side that I see every day. And I want to tell you a story about an 11 year old boy who was in my office two weeks ago who's uh, had a problem with his weight his whole life, a serious problem with his weight. He'd been sent away in tears from his paediatric specialist told that he was too lazy and the reason he was so fat because he ate too much and didn't exercise enough. And we got talking about his weight. Turns out that no one's played with him in the playground for six months. I said, oh, do you think about your weight much, mate? His face dropped and he goes, oh, yeah, I do. What do you mean? He goes, oh, yeah, I think about it 99.9% .9 of the time. And you know, later that day when I was having a bit of a debrief with one of my doctoral students and I burst into tears about that fact. I'm a father of three boys myself of similar age. It occurs to you the lack of progress that we've made in these chronic diseases over the decades. Look, I, I've been a successful career academic and research scientist. I've got a good research centre. I've published um, dozens, if not now hundreds, of public research papers. I've had $25 million of research funding. That, that sounds grandiose, but that's about $800 Australian. Uh, <laughs> uh, hope they don't broadcast that in New Zealand. They, but actually, how much different have I, what's happened on my watch, the first part of my watch? Nothing. Well, actually, not nothing, it's got much worse. Uh, we've now, I just can't seem to do anything about this tidal wave of chronic disease. And I think. I'm prepared to stand up now and have been doing increasingly so and say, hey, we got it wrong. We got it wrong. And I think you can, you can have the conspiracy theories and there's, there's some certain amount of truth in those. But I think part of it was a willingness to do well but to try and simplify messages. And Albert Einstein said, and this is about my extent of what I understand about Einstein, keep things as simple as possible but no simpler. And I think in public health nutrition, we made it too simple. Uh, and the message of eating less and moving more is simple to the point of fundamentally missing how human physiology worked. The system doesn't work that way uh, and never did. And that's why our, our interventions simply don't work. Or indeed, the worst public health crime make the people who are most vulnerable give them the most harm. And I think that's frankly what we've done. And it's time for my field to have a long, hard look at itself. So we're going to do that now. I think in order to do that, and why I want to do a little bit more science with you today, is I don't think my colleagues are going to easily change their mind, especially the older ones. I think this revolution in how we think about food, well it's not even a re revolution, getting back to how we've eaten, is going to come from you in the public. Uh, and you're here, I mean frankly we should be filling up the MCG because this is so important, uh, but we're here in the beautiful St Kilda Town Hall with a smaller audience instead. I think you, the early adopters, the people who have that interest are the ones who will be the part, major part of that revolution with your blogging, your tweeting, your talking and spreading that success one by one, two by two. But we need to be able to explain ourselves how that science work, works and I think that's frightfully important. So I think it starts and finishes with this human brain, the size of it, the fact that it's massive compared to other equivalent animals. It's 1,200 cubic centimetres. 
and it's highly energy demanding. And those things combine to give us some particularly important human physiology. And I think it's a physiology about what I call insulin resistance. We need to be able to supply this big brain constantly with energy. With food present, without food present, we need to be able to store away food very quickly as fat for an upcoming famine. Uh, and that's similar but different to other animals. You'll know that you've got about a teaspoon of glucose floating around in your, your six or seven litres of blood. That's managed very carefully. You've heard about that in previous talks. The main way we do that, this is my little animation. Um, it's, it's not great, but let's see what we can do. Glucose turns up next to your cells. Uh, insulin, that's orange, open up the cell, and that glucose can flow into the cell. That's a normal cell function. That's how insulin works. It's essential for life. Uh, if you looked at people's blood sugar, that's the blue, that's a good trajectory. Peaks after half an hour or so and drops off. It does that because we produce insulin, which removes that. That's, that's normal cell function. There's a couple of other normal cell functions that happen in humans, and they look slightly different. Uh, one has particular relevance to this keto, low carbohydrate diet. That is, uh, you're in starvation or on a very low carbohydrate diet, you become temporarily, peripherally insulin resistant. That's not a problem, that's very important. This is a switch now that when glucose turns up, that glucose gets shoved straight into places that it doesn't need insulin to get to, like the brain. Red blood cells are another good example. They don't need insulin to get in them. And so when you plot glucose, you get your normal glucose response, but you get no insulin response, no insulin required to move those nutrients around. It's a starvation system, it's very important. It's very important because it maintains the whole of the body on fat. So fat's our primary fuel source, and any extra glucose just gets scavenged into, into uh, parts that can, can use it quickly without insulin. So that's great, you can see the use of that. Uh, and if you're in a keto state, you'll be taking advantage of, of the, that state. It doesn't harm your health, it's all good. Insulin resistance here is fine. There's another equally useful state. Loads of food turns up, it's the end of summer, particularly starchy carbohydrates. You now become, again, insulin resistant. Uh, glucose turns up, this time you need loads of insulin, uh, and it starts to maybe shove one into the cell, but it'll shove the rest off into fat. Again, this is an anabolic state. It's absolutely essential for human survival, or has been. The only trouble is, most modern humans are constantly in this state of insulin resistance and plentiful food. So we're all, always in this anabolic storage mode, this inflammatory mode, and that's really the root cause of most of our modern medical problems. It gets trickier because, oh, and, and here's what you get. You get a normal glucose response, maybe, or an abnormal one, but whatever, you need loads of insulin to get to get those, that glucose into the cells, and that's called uh, hyperinsulinemia. Uh, and we call that, well I've called it, you'll hear all sorts of names, I've called it metabolic dysregulation. The system is now shutting down your ability to want to be active, um, and it preferentially partitions your energy into fat at the expense of brain, muscle and organ development. And that'd be great in a temporary state, and you see bears going into this as they start to prepare for hibernation. Hummingbirds, interestingly, of course, their hibernation is just a night because of a high metabolic rate, but they develop fatty, fatty liver, dyslipidemia, uh, and all these sorts of things during the day as they suck down the nectar and they burn through it over that overnight hibernation. Good state to be in. Unfortunately, here's the things in the modern world that all, also cause the same cellular situation. Let's just go through what I think they are. Uh, stress, a poor night's sleep, too much exercise, too little exercise, smoking, a range of environmental pollutions and toxins, not getting enough sunlight, vitamin D deficiency, affects insulin resistance and inflammation, too much sun, getting sunburned, um, a high sugar diet, a high trans fat, omega-6 fat diet, there's inflammatory seed oils in particular, um, a high alcohol diet, uh, poor mi gut microbiome, uh, your ethnicity and gender, probably, um, your age, maybe, obesity, certainly, the fatter you are, the more inflamed you get, 
Um, and perversely, insulin itself is inflammatory. So, in other words, the whole of modern life causes insulin resistance. And this is why we target all of these things in public health. We have this aspirational idea that we would be able to remove some of those. And I think that's only aspirational, that's what, unless we retire everyone to small, remote Pacific Islands subsistence living. We're not going to get rid of all of these things. Uh, what we can do, though, is start to work on some of them more intensively, the big ones. One of the biggest is sugar, that high sugar diet. And for many people, removing that will be enough to get them out of that highly insulin resistant inflammatory cycle. For others, that won't be enough, and they'll need to go further and start to think about some of those other factors. Uh, stress, I think, is particularly a big one in a modern society. Uh, so, just to reiterate, that you've got this dysregulated situation, you're insulin resistant, you chuck in a few carbs, that provokes loads of insulin, and here's the important part that I think we need to communicate in modern science and public health, is that high insulin is directly the cause of cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's and neurological disorders and cardiovascular disease. Hyperinsulemia is the direct and indirect cause. We hear all that, there's other things that are more endpoint. Your blood glucose has got out of control, you're hyperglycemic, you've got high blood pressure, and blah, 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 blah. But the root cause is this hyperinsulemia, yet we hardly discuss that, and we certainly never measure it. And it's time we started doing that. Uh, I think diabetes is where we should start, because it's the most obvious and easy fix. Uh, I'm not the first to start saying this. There's actually a guy called Joseph Kraft, who's a 91-year-old pathologist in Chicago, who just got his career's work, a, a database of uh, measuring people's insulin and glucose in a series of tests over 30 years. Actually, we, we rang, he's still practicing, and we, we rang him the other day in Chicago, and an old guy answered the phone. Hello, well, uh, Dr. Kraft? No, nah, I'll just get Dad for you. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, but here's an example of the sort of work that he'd do. Um, this is five hours of, this is a type 2 diabetic. This is their insulin response to glucose, which is massive. That's hyperinsulemia, that's full-blown type 2 diabetes. Uh, this is the same person a year later after being on a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet. So in other words, what we're seeing here is a complete remission or curing, if you like, of symptoms of type 2 diabetes. I think that's a very important point in my field because, in my opinion, the medical profession treats type 2 diabetes palliatively. You're sick, it will progress worse, uh, and you'll die younger with more complications. See you later. Um, eat the food pyramid. And that's not good enough when you can see results like this. Now, we do need to do more work, uh, and we will do so, but this is a, a great start. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is carbohydrates and the science of in general because I, I get a lot of criticism publicly for promoting low carbohydrate high fat diets and two of the main ones are, well mate, don't you know about these blue zones around the world where people live long healthy lives and they eat a range of macronutrients. Uh, the Kitanawans and the Okinawans and any other Arwans. Uh, and that's true, they do, but they are in the absence of that other slide that I showed, which is everything about stress and sleep and, and the modern lifestyle. Um, I do think that a metabolically healthy human can handle a range of macronutrients, but if you chuck them in a high sugar modern lifestyle, all bets are off. And you'll see now both think places like Japan and China have some of the worst diabetes rates in the world. Second is that, for goodness sake, yeah, we know that sugar's bad, but just get people high quality carbohydrates. It's the glycemic index that counts. And I think when you start to look at the data about this, there's very little, but it's very interesting. And I want to show you some of that now. Uh, this is a study done in India in the 80s. And I'm just going to build the graphs one at a time so you know what I'm talking about. On the uh, left here are people who are metabolically healthy and they give them an, a glucose drink. They chug down the glucose drink and this is their glucose response. Uh, peaks after half an hour or so, drops down, that's entirely normal. 
They give the people on the right who are non-insulin dependent diabetics, people who are insulin resistant, the same drink and they have a much higher glucose response. They have trouble dealing with that glucose. Because it's India, they're interested in lentils, six different types, uh, and there's the glycemic response to lentils for metabolically healthy people. And indeed, you see the point of my people who criticise this, that people who are metabolically healthy have a much better glycemic response to slower release, higher quality carbohydrates. Here's the glycemic response to beans for the metabolically unhealthy. Uh, it's better, certainly better than sugar, isn't it? Um, but it's resembling sugar for the controls. What's much more interesting, though, is when you start to look at the insulin response. So this is the same subjects, but now orange is insulin. The insulin response to drinking glucose for controls. The insulin response to the beans, it's fine. But look what happens when you've got type 2 diabetes. Here's your insulin response to sugar. Here's your insulin response to beans. It looks the same. So the point here is that carbohydrate quality can be beneficial for metabolically healthy people, but as soon as you become dysregulated, all bets are off. It has an adverse metabolic effect on you, and we're not talking about that. And this is why I think carbohydrate restriction in a public health context for our most needy is something we need to take very, very seriously. Uh, a similar study, this one we'll finish with, and this is now over five hours, this is just insulin resistant diabetics. Uh, again, this is their, insulin re their glucose response to just drinking glucose, to some lentils and beans, and to some starchy carbohydrates, bread, rice, potato, oatmeal. And that's interesting, as you'd expect, the, the glycemic responses aren't great, but they're reduced for the better quality carbohydrates. But look what happens when you look at insulin. And this is, remember, hyperinsulinemia is the root cause of these problems of modern lifestyle. Here's the insulin response to glucose. So that's the one, I'll leave it up there, you can compare it. Here's the insulin response to uh, two types of beans. I'll just leave the names up there to show the height. To some of the starchy carbohydrates, rice, uh, bread, potatoes, and this one sneaking up. Look at this one. What is it? Uh, 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 oatmeal. And I think that tells a story, folks, as to why our most vulnerable people in the population, the people who struggle the most to control their weight, the people who have diabetes will develop cancer and the neurological problems and cardiovascular disease, why we should take carbohydrate restriction as a serious public health matter. It, this was published, you'd think this would be an interesting, important study. It was published in one of the most important and cited journals in diabetes, diabetes care, in the late 80s. So far, it's been cited once. It's so important, but it hasn't been, it's been more or less ignored by the medical literature. Um, and it will keep on being ignored. And this is why this grounds up movement, folks, is so so important, um, and we have the technology to do that now, that we start to see that success ourselves and translate it. Uh, look, this seems to have for some reason attracted, at least in my country, and I know the same is true in Australia, a massive amount of controversy that somehow people are going to be lying. I, I'd fully expected to see people lying dead in the streets of Melbourne from this high fat diet, um, probably a whole bunch that have ceased taking their statins, uh, perhaps you're clearing, clearing the bodies up overnight. I don't know. Uh, but it, it hasn't happened, and it won't happen, uh, because what we're talking about, in actual fact, is a diet that resembles what humans have eaten for the majority of the time they've been on the planet. It's actual whole plants and animals. Uh, how that is bad for our health and the evidence that that's bad for our health is completely beyond me. But that is not what we're currently recommending. So, folks, let's get on with it. Onwards and upwards. Thank you very much. If you want to read my blog, it's the addresses at the bottom there. Uh, let's get on with it.